to Moriel Midweek Bible Study. We're continuing our studies from the book of Exodus, chapter 5. We're up to Exodus, chapter 5. Again, in Hebrew, the book of Exodus is Shemot, Shemot, literally the book of names. A couple of announcements before we proceed any further, please. Um, first of all, we encourage people to watch us on a platform other than YouTube. Due to the censorship, the anti-Christian bias, it's become intolerable. Some time ago, it's been intolerable, and it's not getting any better. Um, we are on Rumble. We are on our own platforms where we have the um, complete control ourselves of both moriel.tv and moriel.tv.org. Please watch us on moriel.tv or moriel.tv.org or watch us on RTN or watch us on Rumble. We're doing very well on Rumble and Rumble is growing quickly and we're on various other platforms. If you're watching us on YouTube, please go somewhere else. Go to Moriel TV, go to Rumble, but YouTube is only there to direct traffic to a website that they don't censor and control and that they don't have a bias against. Um, that is just a general announcement that we make periodically. Uh, fortunately, more and more people are watching us on other platforms other than Rumble. I'm sorry, other than YouTube, Rumble is growing particularly quickly, as are our own platforms and RTN and so forth. Meanwhile, a couple of other things very, very briefly. Um, I'm back in Great Britain from the United States. We had a wonderful time. Now, to please pray for progress in our plan for our next film project. Why is this time different? Um, we've been looking at a number of possible directors. Now, if you don't know what's happened, it should have been completed by now, but COVID made it impossible. Filming on location and bringing film crews to Israel and so forth, it was just impossible. It was just legally not even possible, let alone practically. So please pray as we seek to uh, revive this project, which we believe is important and the Lord is calling us to do. We uh, need his guidance. We want to have his wisdom, not our own. There are certain things we can do according to our own understanding, <clears throat> but we don't want to rely on our own understanding. We want to have a green light from the Lord because it's his project. It's not ours. So if you could keep this in prayer. Something else uh, <clears throat> I just have stated once, and I'll state it again for a final time. In the States, one of the things that I was doing, I was traveling with David Lister and uh, with with Maya and Maya's son, uh, Devlin, and sometimes uh, Maya's husband, uh, Jason. And we were traveling around the uh, southern United States and also the area around Washington, D.C. and so forth in Maryland, the Washington suburbs and so forth, and in, <clears throat> into Tennessee. We are going around building up home groups, small groups. There are people who meet in small groups in homes, two or three sometimes, two families sometimes, or uh, almost no, no other churches are around where they are that, that they can attend, so they just meet in homes. The churches are either off doctrinally or something of that nature. So more and more people are meeting in homes, which we have always believed is the Holy Spirit preparing the church for a coming persecution that's already arriving in certain respects. Um, <clears throat> so we've been going around and having meetings in like Holiday Inn Expresses, you know, uh, motels type things. And we've been traveling around. Uh, there was always a team of us. It was always myself and David Lister, uh, Maya and her son, uh, and sometimes her husband. Somebody put out some very malicious gossip that is a complete lie it's just bearing false witness um i'm sorry to say this um <clears throat> first of all not enough people came to the meetings we didn't take up any collections really not enough people came to the meetings to even pay for the hotel rooms and the petroleum the gasoline it, we, 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 it was not it was not a profit-making venture but one of the accusations was we were doing it to build up money and to get money. 
<laughs> if, the only money I've seen is the money we had to spend in doing it. But that was the first lie. The second lie was something much more sinister. That David Lister was traveling around with Maya, a married woman traveling with David Lister. At no time, not for one day, not for one night, not for one meeting, not for one anything, were they ever alone together. There was a team of us the entire time, and I was on that team. Her son was always there, her husband, or her husband, or her husband, and her son was there. Um, the idea that Moriel would allow that, even allow the appearance of sin, is just malicious. This is just malicious gossip. It's it's just it's just the devil's work. It's just the devil's work. It's not true. Uh, there's not a single syllable of truth in it. But when God works, the devil works. And unfortunately, the devil is not beyond using people who profess to be Christians. Uh, I don't know all the circumstances. I'm told the person who is doing it may be very ill and maybe having side effects of medications, possibly, we're speculating. We don't know. We just know it is a bearing of false witness, and not a single syllable of it is true. David Lister has never been alone with Maya or any other woman. Uh, there was a team of us, a team of us. Uh, <clears throat> this is the second time this kind of malicious gossip has happened. The first time was about three years ago or so in Texas, there is a sister named Naomi who is like a stepsister to me and a close friend of my wife and like an aunt to my daughter and a longtime family friend who supported our ministry and so forth. She's a retired medical missionary. She's Jewish, but a believer in Jesus and a medical missionary, worked with the poor, poor children in, in Mexico, but now she's retired to San Antonio, Texas. And when I was last in San Antonio, David Lister and myself went to visit her, uh, and which I had to do, of course, and wanted to do. And we contacted my wife, Skype, whatever we did. So th there was David, my wife, myself, and, uh, and Naomi. And that was it. And we had some fellowship. And we, my wife was back in England, of course, but we contact, contacted her. And then we prayed. And then we went out to the IHOP to get something to eat. And somebody said, I have this Jewish woman in, in San Antonio, Texas. <laughs> How they got that, I don't know. They just obviously lied and made it up. Just malicious, malicious gossip. We've seen a lot of malicious gossip uh, in different ways, but it's getting uglier. And it's really sad when it comes from people claiming to be Christians. Uh, there's not a strain of truth in any of it. It is a complete and utter lie of the devil. And the person who said it is either mentally ill or they're a liar. There's no middle ground. Hate to bring that up, but I've had to because I know some of you have heard it. Let's move on for tonight now. Well, we're continuing our studies in the book of Exodus, the book of Exodus, and we completed chapter 4 in our previous study. Some of the previous studies, because I was traveling in America, had to be pre-recorded, but tonight is being live-streamed. So, <clears throat> we see that chapter 4 concludes with the people witnessing the signs and wonders that Moses did. He speaks to the people and to the elders. The signs are performed in their sight, and the people believed when they heard the Lord was concerned about his son's the sons of Israel, and that he had seen their affliction. Then they bowed low and worshipped, in verse 31, the concluding verse of chapter 4. As always, no chapter division in the original Hebrew canon. Read with me, please. Chapter 5, verse 1. And afterwards Moses and Aaron came to, and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, <clears throat> Let my people go that they may celebrate a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and besides, I will not let Israel go. Notice his arrogance, his arrogance. But because of his arrogance, as we saw in our previous studies, the Lord hardened his heart. The Lord hardened his heart 
in response to his own arrogance. Who is the Lord? Verse 3, then they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go a three-day journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. But the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you draw the people away from their work? Go back to your labors. And again, Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are now many, and you would have them cease from their labors? So the same day, Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters over the people and their foremen, saying, you are no longer to give people straw to make brick, as previously. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. But the quota of bricks which they were making previously, you shall impose on them. You are not to reduce any of it, because they are lazy, or the term could be translated idle. Therefore, they cry out, let us go to sacrifice to the Lord our God. Let the labor be heavier on the men, and let them work at it that they may pay no attention to false words. So the taskmasters of the people and their foremen. Now the taskmasters were Egyptians, the foremen were Hebrews. They went out and spoke to the people saying, thus says Pharaoh, I'm not going to give you any straw. You go and get straw for yourselves, wherever you can find it. But none of your labor will be reduced. So the people scattered throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble for straw. And the taskmasters pressed them saying, complete your work quota, your daily amount, just as when you had straw. Moreover, the foremen of the sons of Israel, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten. They beat the Hebrew foremen and were asked, why have you not compelled your required, completed your required amount, either yesterday or today? and making brick as previously. Then the foremen of the sons of Israel came and cried out to Pharaoh, saying, Why do you deal with us this way, with your servants? There's no straw <clears throat> given to your servants. Yet they keep saying to us, Make bricks, and behold, your servants are being beaten. But it is the fault of your own people. But he said, You are a lazy, very lazy, therefore you say, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. So go now and work, for you shall be given no straw, yet you must deliver the quota of bricks. And the foreman of the sons of Israel saw that they were in trouble because they were told, you must not reduce your daily amount of bricks. When they left Pharaoh's presence, they met Moses and Aaron as they were waiting for them. And they said to them, may the Lord look upon you and judge you. For you have made us odious in Pharaoh's sight and in the sight of his servants to put a sword in the hand to kill us. Notice they turn against Moses. More of that in a bit. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, O Lord, why hast thou brought harm to this people? Why didst thou ever send me? Ever since I came to Pharaoh to speak in thy name, he's done harm to the people. And now has not delivered thy people at all. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh, for under compulsion he shall let you go, and under compulsion he shall drive them out of his land. God spoke further to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord, and I appear to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, Lord, I did not make myself known to them. And I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land to which, which they sojourned. And furthermore, I have heard the groanings of the sons of Israel because the Egyptians are holding them in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. Say, therefore, to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from their bondage. And I also redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. 
Then I will take you for my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. And I will bring you to the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. Again, we have to understand that Pharaoh was deified. He was seen as the son of the sun god, not of Ra. He consorted with the other gods in their temples, and he was worshipped as God. We have an inscription archaeologists found in an Egyptian temple, which states of Pharaoh, of, of Pharaoh stating that he is the one who was, who is, and who is to come in hieroglyphics. He was, he is, he is to come. Now, when you see this, we always have to understand Satan wants to be God. We know this from Isaiah. Uh, we know this from Ezekiel. He wants to be God. And when this desire of Satan is manifested in a man, it is an antichrist spirit inside of that man. Pharaoh had an antichrist spirit. Pharaoh is a major, major type of the Antichrist. He wants to be the one who was, who is, who is to come. He wants to be the one who is the recognized as the son of God, etc. Uh, that is Satan being the father of, of Antichrist. This is the situation we have. So when we look at Pharaoh in these passages... We have to understand he is foreshadowing Antichrist and his behavior, his characteristics, even the nuances of what he says and does hint at Antichrist repeatedly, okay? Building up all the way to what we see in the book of Revelation. Now, let's look. We see Pharaoh's arrogance and we see the judgment of God hardening his heart. Notice that in the previous passages that we read in the last two weeks, God told Moses ahead of time what was going to happen. He told God, God told Moses that Pharaoh's heart was hardened. God told Moses that God was going to harden his heart. God told Moses he was not going to let you go except under compulsion. Everything that was going to happen, Moses was told ahead of time. Yet when it happened, he reached wit's end. He was in a state of despair himself. The people turned against him. And he said, ever since you sent me to talk to Pharaoh, things have only gotten worse for the people. Why did you choose me for this? Why, why did you do this to me? It's only gotten worse for the people. They're blaming me for it now. The fact that God told him ahead of time becomes forgotten or somewhat downplayed, at least overlooked, when the things actually begin to happen. We have to understand this for our own time. Antichrist is indeed coming. The way is being set for him to come. This is unquestionable. It is unquestionable. We are seeing it, of course, in so many spheres. Economic, technological, certainly religion, moral breakdown, and the backsliding apostasy in the church. So many avenues of, of <clears throat> debauchery are converging to one central point that will see ultimately the Antichrist and false prophet. And Antichrist will very much be in the character of Pharaoh. Now look at Pharaoh. <clears throat> what he did to the Jews. Well, this is going to happen. The Antichrist will, of course, try to exterminate the true church or the true believers. They'll try to exterminate the true believers. But then he will turn against the Jews and make their lot impossible. It'll get to the point where they have no hope, no hope. 
and what took place in the Exodus with Moses will be recapitulated. The only hope they will have is in the Lamb, is in the Lamb of God. It is only the Lamb of God that will get them out of it. It's going to happen again. This oppression that you see directed against the Hebrew nation will be directed against believers, but it will be directed against Israel and the Jews. Now notice the character of it. Again, it's a spirit. It's an antichrist spirit. There are many antichrists, and their numbers are increasing. The fact that we've had so many dictators in the last hundred years who basically have had themselves functionally deified. We see this today in Kim Jong-sun and, and his father, Kim Jong-il in North Korea. We saw this in Mao, Zitong. We saw this in Joseph Stalin. We've certainly saw it in Nikolai Ceausescu in Romania. And we've certainly seen it, certainly seen it in Adolf Hitler. In the concentration camps over the gate, where the train lines went in at Auschwitz, Arbeit macht frei, Arbeit macht frei, work makes free. <laughs> A false hope of liberation if you work yourself to death to get it. Well, obviously, the work didn't make free. The Nazis just increased their tasks. There were not only Nazi extermination camps, there were literally camps where the Nazis worked the prisoners, many of them Jews, others gypsies, others political prisoners, but mainly Jews, literally worked them to death. They worked people to death in hard labor manufacturing things for the German war machine, and they would work re re seven days a week, obviously, but, but it would be, they'd be working around the clock. There'd be no rest, very little food, if you wanted to call it food, <clears throat> no proper sleep, nothing like that. <clears throat> Going 20 hours a day, brutally, 18, 20 hours a day, that is what the Nazis did. They just kept increasing their tasks. And if a Jew couldn't keep up with it, they would shoot him in front of the other ones. That's what's going to happen to you if you don't keep up. This was just hellish. Hellish. And it went on and on and on. Well, Hitler did it, but he did not invent it. Hitler did it, but he did not invent it. And the worst is yet to come with the Antichrist and false prophet. I don't say these things, of course, lightly. And I, I, I wish I didn't have to say these things, but they are true. <clears throat> they are true. Let's look. He goes to Pharaoh. Pharaoh says, I'm not going to give you any more straw. Now, obviously, when they were making the bricks, there was not an abundance of straw. They had to go get and cut the straw elsewhere. The straw, we know, contains humic acid. And archaeologists know this now, that the humic acid would be mixed with the, the I'm sorry, the straw would be put into the clay, and the clay would, would be formed around the straw, and it would break down the, the straw. And when the straw was broken down, the humic acids were released, and it strengthened the clay. It made the bricks made made the clay bricks harder. It made the bricks harder. So you've got to make the bricks, but I'm not going to give you the straw. But you're still going to have to make just as many bricks as you used to, even though you're going to go have to go find the straw elsewhere. <clears throat> it became impossible. When they could not meet the quota because it was impossible to do so, Pharaoh's taskmasters beat the Hebrew foremen. They beat them. You're asking me to do something, you've made it impossible to do, and you're beating me because I can't do it. Well, that's the way the Nazis were. That's the way the SS were. That's exactly the way the Nazis behaved towards it. It's the same spirit on back of it. It's the same spirit. It's ancient, but it's coming again in the person of Antichrist. 
he's going to make conditions impossible, first for Christians, then for Jews. Story goes on. They go out and try to do this. Go find the straw. Go get it. Pharaoh says, the people are lazy. How can somebody working 18 hours a day at hard physical labor be lazy? How can they be idle? Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters over the people and their foremen. Don't give them a straw because they're lazy. Let them go. The reason they want to go sacrifice to their God is because they're trying to get out of work. <laughs> this was something that happened in the early centuries of Christianity. Some people have had the mistaken belief that the early Christians were doctrinaire pacifists. They were absolute pacifists. They wouldn't fight in a war or an army or anything like this. And there are still some denominations that teach that. This was not true. This was not true. John the Baptist and Jesus never told the soldiers to stop being soldiers. <clears throat> the reason the early Christians would not serve in the military was because being in the Roman legions required participating in pagan sacrifices to other gods, to demon idols, which they would not do. And that was they had their own God, their own faith, their own belief, their own Messiah. They were not going to sacrifice to demon idols. That, that was the problem. That is why they wouldn't serve in the legions. It was not that they were in principle opposed to military service. It was not that it, they, they were not pacifists as such. In this, before Bar Kokhba was pronounced the Messiah by Rabbi Akiva, Jewish believers fought in the Second Jewish Revolt in, in, in the early second century. They fought against the Romans as Jews in the Second Jewish Revolt up until Bar Kokhba was proclaimed the Messiah by Rabbi Akiva. They wouldn't follow a false messiah. They had the true one. Therefore, they were seen as traitors who wouldn't fight the Romans. <laughs> but there was a reason. Be careful of people who try to teach a dogmatic Christian pacifism. Um, that, that Turning the other cheek, this kind of thing. That only means don't return evil for evil. It doesn't preclude justice. It doesn't preclude self-defense. Jesus said, Bring two swords in one, one place. Now, of course, that has to do with the Old and New Testament. The Word of God, there's a symbolic meaning in it, of course. But Jesus said, if, the, if you knew what time your house was going to be broken into, you would defend it from, from the klepton, from the thief. The Scriptures do not defend, and the New Testament does not uh, 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 decry or forbid things like self-defense or military service per se. But when that military service causes you to have to go against the word and law of God, that's where you draw the line. I saw something disgusting on a YouTube clip yesterday in Reading, Pennsylvania. Homosexuals and lesbian activists were in the city hall yelling, doing their thing, carrying their flags, and a believer with a sign with a gospel message on it, was reading from the scripture. He was just reading from the scripture. Across the street, he was not interfering with the and the transvestites and so forth. He was across the street, but he was reading from the scriptures loudly. Public property, getting his message out, they were getting their message out. And this wicked cop, a wicked, wicked man, was going to give account to Christ. His name is Bradley McClure. He wrestles this Christian, pushes him up against the wall and handcuffs him and locks him up. There have been many instances of this. Many instances. Now remember, governments and police and things are, are God's servants. They're God's servants. But as we looked at last week, 
when we looked at the staff, what happens when government falls into the hands of Satan? That happened in Germany. And that's what we're dealing with here in uh, Egypt. I watched the video clip. Canada is dying. And it is unbelievable. They were letting murderers out of jail with eight-year sentences. People, who, one, one murderer, he had over 50 criminal convictions for violent crime. He murdered an innocent person, and he got a slap on the wrist. Um, they're letting these guys, 26 people have been murdered in Canada by criminals who the courts were politically pressured to let go by two Canadian laws, one called C-5 and one called C-75 by Mr. Trudeau's government. It's unbelievable. They have shoplifters that have been convicted 150 times and never did a day in jail. 150 times. Violent criminals being released within a matter of hours. Vancouver and Toronto being the worst places, but it's coast to coast in Canada now. And it's getting worse. It's getting worse. Well, what are the Canadian police being told to do? What are the Mounties being told to do by the government? Arrest truck drivers who are protesting COVID <laughs> vaccinations or they're arresting preachers for holding church services? They arrested another preacher for opposing sexual indoctrination of homosexual indoctrination of children and four or five Canadian cops tackled him and, and arrested him in front of his wife and kids. It's going to get like that. Until Antichrist comes, it's going to get like that and then it will get worse. That is the way it was in Egypt. We have to understand when we look at this epic in Exodus, we're not just looking at the past, we're looking at the present and the coming future. Satan is in power. He knows his time is short. He's getting desperate. He hates believers and he hates Jews. Government will be given over into the hands of the Antichrist and false prophet. That's what's going to happen. Well, let's continue looking now at chapter 5. They do the best they can, but they still can't make the quota. Verse 19, And the foremen of the sons of Israel saw that they were in trouble because they were told, you must not reduce your daily amount of bricks. When they left Pharaoh's presence, they met Moses and Aaron as they were waiting for them. And they said to them, May the Lord look upon you and judge you, for you have made us odious in Pharaoh's sight and in the sight of his servants to put a sword in their hand to kill us. They blame Moses and Aaron for what Pharaoh was doing to them. They were already odious in the sight of Pharaoh. When persecution comes, there are going to be believers, professing believers at least, who are going to blame faithful believers for the persecution. One of these theocratic hooligans died the week before last, and I call him a theocratic hooligan with pride, because that's what he was, Tim Keller. When asked about the homosexuality and lesbianism, he would only say it's not God's best. He wouldn't say it was wrong or what the scripture said. Instead, he, began, he went on a tear rod castigating Christians who were opposing it, saying that they're lacking compassion and understanding and didn't. I have compassion and understanding. I don't want homosexuals to go to hell. I want them to repent and get saved. Read Romans. This is just a theocratic hooligan, a worthless theocratic hooligan. 
Yet he's esteemed. He's esteemed by many people, but he was nothing more than a theocratic hooligan. You've heard us talk about J.D. Greer saying that born-again Christians have to be the number one spokesman and advocates for homosexual rights and lesbian rights, the rights to indoctrinate children at the age of five. This is what you're dealing with. You are going to have Christians, Christians attacking other Christians. The Christians who uphold the word of God are going to be attacked by others. We don't want the pressure. We want to get along with everybody. We have to be friends with these people and reach them with the gospel. You're not going to reach them with the gospel. God gives them over to this perversion. You're not going to reach them. Now, I know homosexuals and lesbians who the Lord has saved. Brothers and sisters in Christ who Jesus has saved, and he still saves them. But ask for their testimonies. They don't play around. They don't say, we have to be this and we have to. They say it is wrong. That's what you see. It's like anything else. Those who, 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 who go soft on Roman Catholicism. No, ask an ex-Catholic about what the Roman church is. They're not going to play. They're going to tell you the truth. It's the whore of Babylon and Christian masquerade. They're not going to play around. Ask somebody saved out of Talmudic Judaism what it is. It's a false Judaism. The rabbis are the deceivers of our people. Oh, we have to be nice to see them get saved. <laughs> Again, did Jesus pull any punches with the woman at the well when she began with her false religion or with the Syrophoenician woman? No. Well, you don't pull punches when you talk to Muslims. You don't pull punches when you talk to homosexuals. You're not looking to be provocative, but you are addressing the facts. God says this is wrong. This is why it is wrong. Oh, you offended me. No, I didn't. God did. And you offended him with your lifestyle. You are going to find Christians who are more interested in not upsetting the apple cart than they are in evangelism. Now, ultimately, this does not work. It certainly will not work with homosexuality, as we see in the saga of Lot. Lot could not placate them. As we've said 30 years ago, 25 years ago, sorry, homosexuality and lesbianism are going to become more and more mil militant, insatiable. You cannot reason or compromise with these people. They're going to become more and more demanding. They are not demanding equality. They are demanding preferential treatment and access to your children to indoctrinate them. And you're not going to stop them. And the last thing the body of Christ needs is a theocratic phony like Tim Keller not standing up and telling the truth, but instead insulting those Christians who do tell the truth. I'm not saying I'm glad Tim Keller is dead. But the body of Christ is a lot better off without people like him. Quote me. Tell his devotees and fans that I said it. Indoctrinating children in schools at the age of five. And all you can say is it's not God's best. No, Jesus said it's better to have a millstone tied around your neck, Tim Keller. But you know that now because Jesus is repeating it to your face. We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That includes me. I'm only going by what it says in the book.
Moses stood up. Aaron stood up. The people were legitimately suffering now. But they began blaming Moses and Aaron. Oh, it's the fault of the Christians who are saying homosexuality is wrong that we're having these problems and that a Christian school was broken into and shot up by a lesbian and, 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 and that, that, that we're having these church attacks and these things are happening. It's because of those Christians who stand up and speak out against it know the word of God speaks out against it. Now, for me, the best case scenario would be for a lesbian or a homosexual to get saved and praise God for the ones who do. But there's not many of them. But thank God for the ones who have been saved. And hopefully who will be saved. That's the best case scenario. Their sin is no worse and no more hell damning than my own. However, it's still sin. Beware, as persecution mounts, there's going to be people claiming to be Christians who are going to do what Tim Keller did, blame other Christians. Instead of blaming the persecutors, they're going to blame other Christians for provoking the persecution when all they did was preach the gospel and quote the word of God. Now Moses. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, O Lord, why hast thou brought harm to these people? Why did you send me? Ever since I came to Pharaoh to speak in his name, he's done harm. The people get pushed to their limit. It is only an utter desperation that they were able to be saved. Okay. Forget about cheap grace. Grace, again, is free. It is not cheap. There's nothing more expensive. It's a gift. But it's not cheap. It cost God everything when he gave his son in our place. Read the Pilgrim's Progress. John Bunyan explained the gospel really well. When the evangelist came and, and he comes, save me from the city of destruction. And he got, got, got to go through the wicked gate. He was desperate. He knew destruction, doom, damnation was what was at hand. Every unsaved person is heading for eternal damnation. Fallen man is heading for eternal damnation. The kingdom of this world is heading for eternal damnation. There must be a genuine sense of desperation to want to be saved. It's hopeless. Only God can save me. I can't save myself. It's hopeless. There must be this realization of desperation. Now, if somebody is saved as a child in a Christian family, that will grow. They'll come to understand that as they grow up in their faith. But when you see these people, God loves you and he just wants to bless you. Put your hand up and accept Jesus into your heart. These things are formulas for false conversions. There must be a sense of desperation. Think of somebody on a deathbed dying of a terminal disease. They're desperate. If there is a physician who comes and says, I have a cure. You got one hope. In their desperation, they'll do it. In order not to die from gangrene, there's people who will consent, sign the consent form for amputation. Because they're desperate.
desperate. But now let's look at Moses and Aaron. They were already told what was going to happen. But when the people turned against them the first time, it began to affect them. And these were the leaders. Remember, it says in Peter, the righteous are scarcely saved. Look at Moses and Aaron now. This is the first time after they go to Pharaoh that the people turn against them. It would later happen in the wilderness, wouldn't it? It would happen in Exodus 15 at Elim. It would happen in the rebellion of Korach. The people would keep turning against them. When things got tough, the people turned against the leadership. And you see that so often in churches. When things get tough, they blame the leaders. The leaders may be at fault, but it may not be their fault. It's just the way it is, and it's the hand of God in it. Moses and Aaron had to experience this in Egypt before they could handle it in the desert. They had to know what the people were like. If somebody is going to go into ministry as a leader, as a pastor, an elder, know what people are like. They are going to whinge. They are going to blame you for things which you have no control over. People always like to blame somebody other than themselves. Now, you can blame the devil. You can blame the devil. Sure, he's responsible for all our trouble. Even when God allows it, it's him. We can blame the devil, it's no problem. But sometimes we have to blame ourselves. Even Moses begins to doubt. Now, what's important about this? Go back to the previous chapter 4. Verse 30 and 31. Aaron spoke all the words which the Lord had spoken to Moses, which the Lord had spoken to Moses. He performed the signs in the sight of the people, so the people believed that the Lord was concerned about them. Even having seen the signs and wonders, even having seen the miracles, when pressure, opposition, persecution intensifies, it doesn't matter. You see these people in the word faith rubbish, chasing signs and wonders, a wicked and a <laughs> adulterous generation. They think that's the proof of the pudding. Or like the late John Wimber's power evangelism, that place is in some kind of a split now. In, in Anaheim, California, their vineyard. They saw the signs and wonders, and they believed. But once persecution came, once opposition came, once seemingly impossible circumstances came, it didn't matter. It didn't matter. I don't care how many signs and wonders people have seen that will lose their faith when things get tough if they're basing their faith on signs and wonders. Now God acts. Now they're at wit's end and God knows it. God will never let us undergo more than we can handle. If we push beyond the bounds of our capacity, his grace will be sufficient. The only one he has ever abandoned, the, the only one who he's ever abandoned, who called on him in sincerity and truth, was his son. Because of our sin, 
He has no reason to listen to our pleas. He listens to our pleas for the sake of his son who took our sin. The only one God ever turned his back on would not help was his son Jesus. That's the only one God ever rejected, forsook, wouldn't help. It's the only one. But because of his son, he's not going to forsake us. No matter how desperate things seem to be. And generally are. I knew a woman named Rose Wormer. A believing Jew. I knew her in Israel, but she was from Europe. My wife, Pavia, myself knew her quite well. Because she was a believing Jew, she could have escaped arrest when the Gestapo came to arrest the Jews where she was. She had a chance of escaping because she had a Christian identity. She could have got out of it and fled. The Holy Spirit told her, tell them you're a Jew. You're going to be my witness in those concentration camps. They put her in Auschwitz. She's one of the few survivors. She went through Auschwitz voluntarily because the Lord told her to do it and gave her the grace to do it. And she led Jewish women to Christ before they were put into Gas chambers and ovens. She wrote a book called The Journey. My wife's mother translated it into Romanian. I knew I knew Sister Rose Wormer. She's with the Lord now, of course. What a book. You want to talk about which end? We don't even know what which end is. Rose Wormer knew it. She volunteered to go to Auschwitz to preach the gospel to Jews before they were exterminated by the Nazis. And she did it. The scriptures tell us that there are men of whom the world is not worthy, and there are. But there are also women of whom the world is not worthy, and she was one of them. And I consider it to be a blessing and a privilege to have known her. You see what I will do to Pharaoh. Under compulsion, he'll let you go. For God spoke to Moses saying, I am the Lord. And I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty. But my name, Lord, that is Yehovah, Yahweh, Jehovah, I did not make known to them. In the patriarchal narratives in the book of Genesis, God made himself known to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But they knew him as El Shaddai. El Shaddai. Sometimes translated God Almighty, but that's not what it actually means in Hebrew. It means God of the mountains. Now, this idea of the mountain, God of the mountain. Obviously, it points to Mount Sinai, where the temple was, where God would meet with man. Holy place where God dwells to meet with man. That is Mount Sinai, uh, Mount uh, Zion. Mount Sinai, where the deck hard hearted, Mount Hordev, Mount Sinai, where the law was given. God meets on the mountain. He meets, he meets on the mountain. Ilon More, where it was Christophany, the Lord Jesus, as he would be later known, the Son of God walked with Abraham on Ilon More, overlooking Shechem, up on the mountain. God meets man on the mountain. We say Mount Calvary. Mount Calvary is a little more complicated. 
The scripture says Golgotha, Golgotha. Golgotha in Aramaic means place of the skull, of the skull. It could also mean a, a balded head, but it really means skull. Uh, skull, yeah. But in Latin, when you translate it into Latin, it's Calveria, Calveria, where you get Calvary. Some kind of mount or hill that looked like a skull. Now, in terms of appearance, the most likely candidate for this would be Gordon's Calvary, next to the garden tomb in East Jerusalem, overlooking the Arab bus station near Damascus Gate, opposite Damascus Gate. That it even looks like a skull today, but the geomorphologists say it would have looked more like a skull 2,000 years ago. Um, <clears throat> there are other possible places near the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and so forth. But the idea is he's the god of the mountain, the god of the mountain, of the mount. In the time of Abraham, it would have been the mount of, on the west of, of, uh, Mesopotamia, that Abraham would have had to cross over. He would be called to head to the west, to Israel, from where he was in Ur of the Chaldees. God always meets with man on the mount, always meets on a mount, uh, the mount of his choice. There are false mountains with pagan temples and so forth, but this is the right mount. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob only knew him as the god of the mount, of the mountain, as El Shaddai, that's all. They didn't know his name, Yahweh, Yehovah, Asher Haya Hove Veyavo, who was, who is, who is to come. Now, this is who Pharaoh claimed to be, but it's who God actually is. So God would manifest his name through Moses. Through Moses. For those who don't know, look very briefly at Deuteronomy 18 once again. We have mentioned this in our introductory Bible study on Exodus. I will raise up a prophet from among the countrymen like you. The Messiah would be a prophet like Moses. Well, what did Moses do? Moses manifested the name of God to the people. Look with me, please, to the Gospel of St. John, chapter 17, please. Verse 6, I manifested thy name to the men whom thou hast given me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them to me, and they have kept thy word. I manifested thy name. John 17, verse 6, John 17, 26. And I have made thy name known to them and will make it known that the love wherewith you did love me may be in them and I in them. Moses made the name of God known to the people. Jesus makes the name of God known to the people. But let's look further. I've heard the groanings of the sons, it says in Exodus chapter 6, verse 5, because the Egyptians. Therefore, I am the Lord. I will bring you out of Egypt. I'll deliver you. I'll redeem you with an outstretched arm. Then I will take you for my people and be your God, and you will know that I am the one who brought you out of Egypt, the one who swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to you this land for possession. It goes back to the patriarchs, but it's a progressive revelation. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Abraham was called Yedidiah, the friend of Yahweh. He had a relationship with God on, on Elon More. Okay. The patriarchs begins. But 
God didn't tell his name to the patriarchs. <laughs> tell his name to Moses. Then there's the law. But when the law is fulfilled in Jesus, there's more revelation. God reveals himself progressively. Progressively. It begins with the patriarchs. Then it goes with Moses. Then it goes with the Messiah. But as everything else, there is more to come. The book of Revelation tells us this. There is more to be revealed about God. He will reveal more of himself to us, but it's progressive. The same God who revealed himself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob revealed more of himself to Moses. The same God who revealed more of himself to Moses revealed more of himself still in and through Jesus. But the best is yet to come. We shall be as he. We're never going to be God, but we're going to know him as Jesus knew him in eternity. In the meanwhile, we have to face realities. Things are going to become very, very desperate. There's going to be more pressure, first against Christians, and then against Jews. And it is only in this desperation that God will be able to act. Why? The most recent Barna and Briarly reports show that only about one-third of Christians believe in the sin eternal sinlessness of Christ. <laughs> only a third. Only a third. It's shocking. Shocking. How many things that the Word of God says are absolutely fundamentally true or being rejected is not necessary or optional. They don't know him. The people in Israel at the time of Pharaoh did not know what Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob knew. They no longer knew what Joseph knew. They no longer knew those things. Christians in Great Britain, most of them no longer know what Charles Spurgeon knew or what John Wesley knew or, you know, or what Martin Lloyd-Jones knew. They don't know. Believers in the United States no longer know what Harry Ironside knew, you know, what D.L. Moody knew what Jim Elliot knew. They don't know. And it's going to take desperation. Desperation to cause them to want to find out again. This is what happened in the past. But it's also what is going to happen in the future. But look at it. Did God get them through it? Yes. Did God get Moses and Aaron through it? Yes. Did he get them out of Egypt? Yes. Is he going to get us through it? That same God is going to get us through it. Not only is he able to do it, he has promised he will do it. That same God who destroyed Pharaoh will destroy the Antichrist and false prophet. That same God who got them out of Egypt will get us out of this fallen world. He's promised. I'm not saying things are not desperate. I'm not saying things are not going to become more desperate. I'm saying they will become more desperate. But I'm also saying the book of Exodus is not just about the past. It's about the future. 
And it's not just about the future of Israel and the Jews, although it is. It's about our future. God will not fail us. God can not fail us. He has never failed. He has never failed, and he never will. He didn't fail Moses and Aaron. He didn't fail Israel. He didn't fail anybody. Even his own son he raised from the dead. One way or another, he never fails. And he's not going to fail us either. We have his personal guarantee. Thank you so much for listening. We'll continue next week with Exodus chapter 6 and Exodus 6. God bless.